there was this yearning to really um, understand more about my African roots. And of course, with the inequalities and the injustices that Black and Brown people face in America and New York at large, um, there was that, that, that Marcus Garveyism, the drive, all those things kind of sort of fueled my activism. And so that was really where the birth of the uh, African Heritage Day Parade came from. And then that birthed two other parades, two other festivals. So, you know, I, I was born in Brooklyn when we moved to Staten Island in probably 1979. And uh, at some point, I, I lived in Nigeria, London, came back here. But I grew up in the neighborhood we saw today. That's why I'm never going to speak. Okay. I spoke but about I it. Yeah, I see a lot. This was at the height of the AIDS epidemic, the crack epidemic. Yeah. So it was a very tough and rough time to be growing up there. And crime was out of control. Um, I mean, the injustices that you've seen today were super amplified. Things have gotten bad, to be honest with you. So my upbringing was a mix of growing up with African Americans and then African immigrants who uh, mainly came from Nigeria and West African countries, but particularly Liberia and Sierra Leone. Because mm. during this was during the time of civil unrest in those countries. That's right. So there was an influx of refugees. So you had a mix of uh, Black America, continental, you know, diaspora. Oh, we got along, you know, there were not a lot of issues at the time. So I was one of a few. Um, so, you know, uh, being a knucklehead, being a young kid trying to figure out the culture and identity. Where I have the honor to sit down on a prominent member in the leader of the African diaspora here in New York City, specifically Staten Island, Mr. Bobby D. Right, good to see you. We've been talking about, you know, how that sit out for a while. It's been a uh, And we're finally making it happen. And I'm really excited to hear your story. You had a great event, which is the African Parade. Yeah. And to start off, I just want you to tell me about your involvement in planning for the African Parade. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm really honored and I feel it's a privilege to have, uh, you know, young Africans who are interested in the blessing that we're able to share this space together, first of all. Um, yeah, uh, the African festival, Heritage Festival, uh, that occurred today is really uh, a wonderful initiative. Um, that we Africans in the diaspora living on Staten Island, particularly, are utilizing to really amplify the uh, beauty and the depth and breadth of the Africans in the diaspora who live here, who contribute here, and who, of course, are you know, part of the fiber that makes New York uh, such uh, a melting pot. Um, so, I mean, go back to history to about 2005. Um, I founded the first ever Black Heritage Day parole uh, on Staten Island in the Staten Island history. And the reason that was necessary and the reason why I'm proud to have been uh, the initiator of that um, was because as, I mean, I grew up in Bunk Hill, the state that grew up in Los Angeles, you know, the area that was a bit me. You know, the experience and the, 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 the privilege of having the best of all the as well. That's right. But as I grew older, there was this yearning to really um, understand more about my African roots. And of course, with the inequalities and the injustices that Black and Brown people face in America and New York at large, um, there was that, that, that Marcus Garveyism and that Queenie Fuma the drive, all those things kind of sort of view my activism. And so that was really where the birth of the uh, African Heritage Day Parade came from. And then that birth two other parades, two other festivals. One is the one that the African American community does is an African American parade. And then the second was what we saw today, which was the um, African Heritage Festival. So there were two, but then there were one initially, and they became two. And we celebrate, in fact, the, the convener of the other one to go for me, 
Uh, she was there at today's okay. festival. So it's a celebration yeah. of Blacks in the diaspora and descendants of Africans from the continent of Africa. So the privilege to be there, you can see me in my flowers representing. Um, yeah, so that was, and I'm glad that you guys got to look this Because originally that was a quite good play. That's huge. Yeah. Great stuff, man. So that kind of impact you making in not just Staten Island, but the city as a whole. And, you know, I commend you for doing that. You're doing an amazing job with that. So I know you mentioned that you grew up in Staten Island. So you have a strong tie to Staten Island. Oh, yes. Can you tell me about your, you know, your life, for living here, growing up here? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I was born in Brooklyn, but we moved to Staten Island. I got my in 79. And uh, at some point, I lived in Nigeria, London, came back here. But I grew up in the neighborhood you saw today. That's where we heard me speak. Okay. I spoke but about that's block. Yeah, that's same block. Oh, I grew up in Park Hill. And at the time I was growing up there, this was at the height of the AIDS epidemic, the crack epidemic. Yeah. So it was a very tough and rough time to be growing up there. And crying was out of control. Um, I mean, the injustices that you've seen today were super amplified. Things have gotten better, to be honest with you. So my upbringing was a mix of growing up with African Americans and then African immigrants who uh, mainly came from Nigeria and West African countries, but particularly Nigeria and Sierra Leone. Because during this was during the time of civil unrest in those countries. That's right. So there was an influx of refugees. So you had a mix of uh, Black America, continental, you know, diaspora. But well, we got along, you know, there were not a lot of life issues at the time. So I was one of a few. Um, so, you know, uh, being an uncle and being a young kid trying to figure out the culture and identity, uh, you know, like, I would say I, 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 I got in trouble often. Mm-hmm. Um, but that also was kind of much of what really sharpened and fostered who I am. But let me say that thanks to my strong parents who were connected to the African culture. And if you know what I mean, like, you know, they didn't play around with the kids. Right. This was very disciplined. Yeah, you know, so um, I think uh, as a kid, I was I was sent to Nigeria to kind of experience the other side. And I can say on back, that's probably what saved my life. Mm-hmm. And also what uh, sharpened my um, discipline and my my skill sets, sort of like, like being focused and being driven. Correct. Um, so I, I, I credit a lot on that to, to having been able to go back. So when I came back, because I went to college, um, started a small business, a uh, home improvement business. Mm-hmm. That was the idea my way to college. My work ethics was the same. When I say sick, I mean like I worked, uh, I had one company, I worked two positions, and I have, I'm part of the main in the college. Yeah, so I read that. <laughs> 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 so, so, you know, sometimes I'll eat a different time. And, you know, and when I'm, be honest with you, I always grew up to be a businessman, right? Because, you know, as an African, you, your parents tell you, you gotta get that degree, you gotta get that education. So I went in and went hard, you know, I was like, you know, let me get this to get this out of the way. Right. And when I graduated, um, at the time I was making money because I was, I was, you know, I was one of the few, Black owned home improvement companies. Yeah. And where I had worked before, I really was, I made some good connections. I was working at a doctor's hospital and the doctors would give me the contracts to do the indication. Mm. So, you know, if you do a good job with words, Rex, if you screw up, you don't get no business. Mm. And I, never, I was very determined. So any contract I got, I went above and beyond. And because of that, the doctors would refer me to other doctors right. to the point. And I was young, I was like 20 years old. The business blew up, uh, but I never had any formal business management. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, so I kind of got freaked out because, you know, I had more work than I could manage. And I think I was more probably as a kid focused on body control. Mm-hmm. So I stepped back from the business and I focused on my school, man, made some the money. I was like, okay, I didn't focus on my school. Probably maybe had no more than six thousand dollars in student loans, mm-hmm. which I paid off fairly quickly. Anyway, that opportunity exposed me to the importance of home ownership. Wow! Because I saw these doctors whose vacation homes I was facing, and then it started to open my mind, you know. And uh, when I graduated, I wanted to do a real estate course with the person that I was going to be attached to. 
winded up not really being someone who was kind of credible. Um, so I winded up putting the money I had, buying real estate and fix it because I already had the renovation experience. Right. So I bought cheap, renovated, and I was able to sell it. one. Yeah. Man. So I actually started knowing that was that knowledge early. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I made some really good margins. So I continued that and I found love and passion in that. But let me tell you something, the margin in the real estate was everything. But simultaneously, I owned the revenue. So I decided and I bought a bought very nice house at the time, but then I decided to move to Japan. What made me move to Japan was because I had met some Japanese and my ex and girlfriend who turned into my ex-wife at the time. Um what I some in some way I, I met Japanese artists who were coming to New York. And they would come to New York because they wanted the New York style music production. <laughs> and more were coming and they were getting overcharged. So I said, I had my guess, you know what? If I stay, if I go to Tokyo and I sell a production house, then I'll get all the business. It's <laughs> opportunity. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I took a couple of hundred thousand dollars. I, I said, I'm going to go to Japan. I'm going to go bigger. Mm. And I had a space probably slightly bigger than this. Mm. And I divided it into four units. One was production suite, the recording studio. The other was a lounge. One was my office, and then the other was a fashion booth. Wow. And that was see because I knew about the connection between music and fashion. Yes. And the Japanese, they were paying tons of money for merch that I was getting and going like in the hat. Wow. So I was against. So I had this duplex that was servicing. You know, people would come in and show in the lounge. Some come to the corner, and some came to buy the fashion. That quickly became very successful. I was the only independent record label in Tokyo, probably Japan. I didn't know about the other thing. So, so let me ask you this. Were you producing music yourself? Yes, I was. Wow. So I was producing Japanese artists. I actually signed a Japanese reggae artist who I made a world to America. And then, and then I had him under my big which is still on the team at the time. It was after my first ball, mm-hmm. I started laying on. The low one was actually in space in his image. And so going to Japan, culture shower. But again, work ethics. I was the guy that would network. People were blown away by the space. And I built the space, by the way. So the space was an open space. And I divided it up. Again, going back to my own yeah. knowledge. Yeah. Saying, That's right. Oh. Yeah, some of the artists who I took from American with that actually helped. Jabami, shout out to Jabami. He's yeah. the very most. He's like, what you know, brother? I at least I took him to Japan. I took him about two thousand friends, so they're about. So we started this label. We winded up producing Japanese artists. When artists would come from America to Japan, my place is where they stopped. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, fun fact: when Kanye West, before he was before anybody knew who he was, had uh, wanted to meet with, I didn't know who it was, mm-hmm. and I had my vice president of my label meet with him at the time. This is my yeah. formula. Yeah. Um, and then we also like, uh, have Michael Jackson, a lot of hip hop artists came to, um, LL, a lot of different hip hop artists. And I became very close to the radio DJ who I'm still close to today. Mm-hmm. MC Room. Shout out to MC Room. Shout out to Smooth. Yeah. And, and you know, so we made the community in Japan. Yeah. Trust was built. So I started doing festivals, made a lot of money in that. Then I got homesick after about eight years. Mm. By the way, I had I had one son at the time. My middle son was born in, in, in Yokohama. Then I, then I came back to America because I was homesick. And when I came back to America, <coughs> what inspired my civic behavior aspect is I had been fortunate, you know. Here I was, I graduated. I went to Japan. Thank God I did well. When I came back, I went to my old neighborhood and I saw nothing had changed. Whatever happened, like I went, all that time I went away, came back to America, I thought, I don't know what I thought. I thought, yo, you know, things were going to be different, better. This is the one I was in us since we did that. So I started out saying, wow, I'm going to support and sponsor and magic and more community groups. Then I realized I was throwing money at the problem. Mm-hmm. You know, because when you go to see what you're investing in, it may not have been what your budget was or whatever. Then ultimately, I started getting very close to participating organized, right? Yeah. Um, actually 
buying things that maybe community need and whatnot. And I said, then I said, you know what? I need an organization that I can do this thing. That's when I created I Island Voice. Island Voice. Voice was an organization, a platform to give voice to the underserved. Right. Because, because of Staten Island and No Man is an Island, and Island in your voice, that was the concept around that. And there was going to be an organization and a newspaper. That was also what I was going to So you had the newspaper slash the magazine attached to that. Pretty much, yeah. And, and the reason that was important is because on Staten Island, there was only one newspaper. And at the time, that newspaper covered more white people. And when they covered black people, mm-hmm. It was either when they would be arrested, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Blacks would never want to front page unless it was somewhere negative. Right. And I hate that. So mm-hmm. I wanted to counter that. So I didn't voice was going to tell the stories of African, African American curriculum. Mm-hmm. And also we were going to focus on economic empowerment, cultural awareness, and then like also like youth empowerment. So through the youth empowerment, I created the youth empowerment summit. Which is 18 years old. Mm. And in 18 years, I've empowered over 10,000 people. And how do we do that? Every youth summit, we account for over 500 young folks. And then we pair them up with people who are successful. And then they get a mentor or an opportunity to like figure out how to work college, if it's job preparedness. When you amplify that over time or you follow that up, you see that you're hitting a data that, that you have catching a data, you hit the ball in yeah. a target point. You replicate that over the years and multiply that, you touch X amount of lives. Right. So that was on the one end of the youth summit. The other thing we did was did economic empowerment workshops. Those workshops again, we teach you people about ocean. We teach you people about how to prepare for job readiness. We teach people about essay writing, that's kind of so on and so forth. Yeah. <laughs> and this is, this is really just my formula is by seeing the element of the Yeah. And then the thing is, I want to do what I love. At the same time, whatever I love, I'm going to make sure that I'm touching my and empowering me. So it's symbiosis. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Great job, man. <laughs> yes. So somebody who could really tell us, you could go on and on. I write, I write a bunch of books. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, definitely it's all working. All these years you guys been working through the audience yeah. out there to really learn yeah. about how uh, businesses come about, how you find opportunities. So, in broken places, you know, sometimes you know, God put us in positions where we're challenged. That's right. And challenge is what really birthed us for purpose. That's right. right. Yeah. 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 This is what I believe you're all of them. And, you know, I, I really uh, think you're doing a great job. And it seemed like it was all orchestrated for it to happen in mm-hmm. the way And, you know, we you've really utilize that opportunity that you got to really turn it into something that's changing lives. Amen. <laughs>